All right, let's dive in. Joe Robinson, welcome back to the Guitar Music Theory podcast. Thank you very much, Desi. It's great to be back with you. Thanks for having me. So last time we talked, I was still living in my hometown of Toledo, Ohio. This was about seven or eight years ago. I think it was back in 2013. Um, you had already moved to Nashville at that time, uh, a couple of years uh, prior to that, and were um, busy uh, uh, with your career. And then uh, coincidentally, at that, around that time, I was also looking to relocate, and I chose to relocate to the Nashville area uh, as well. So we're not too far from each other. You're closer to the city. I'm a little f uh, further away, but it's great to get uh, reconnected here. Yeah, I'm glad you're in town. Nashville is such a great music community, you know, and it's spread out, of course, to Franklin and Spring Hill. And I'm in the, I'm in the Bellevue neighborhood right now, so a little west of town. And I love it. I've been in Nashville since 2010. And time really flies. Yeah. Yeah. And there are tons of musicians here. I mean, I heard that before I moved here, but I just didn't realize like how true it was, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, just, I mean, even here in Spring Hill, it's like, you know, a neighbor who's a producer and another neighbor who, you know, tours with a major act and they're just, they're just all over the place, you know, so it, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a neat community. Well, why don't we start with you kind of, uh, I know you're involved in a lot of things because you're a singer songwriter, you know, you're a super skilled guitar player, both in electric styles and acoustic styles and finger style chord melody. Um, and in the past few years, you have created a lot of instructional courses, so you're known for that as well. Why don't you just kind of let us know what some of your recent projects are that you've recently released or what you're uh, working on? Well, I have a number of courses available with Truefire. And so I've been shooting courses with them for about five years. And at the start of the pandemic, they started to launch uh, channels on Truefire's website. So I created my own channel. It's called Guitar Synergy. And uh, throughout the uh, pandemic, I've been posting a lot of videos and gradually getting to a point where I can record split screen tutorials for all my songs and a lot of great arrangements. So there's about uh, 250 videos right now up there. So Guitar Synergy is where people can find information about that. Just Google Joe Robinson Guitar Synergy. And uh, I also have a course called Joe's 12 which is a 12 week uh, program in which we cover things like practicing and uh, songwriting, recording, uh, ar arranging songs. It's kind of a real big picture view of what it takes to be a kind of a well-rounded guitar player these days. And I interviewed a lot of my mentors for that course. So I interviewed, you know, legendary people like Steve Vai and Tommy Emanuel and Eric Johnson, Robin Ford, and uh, Grammy Award winning songwriter Rodney Crowell, Gary Nicholson, Brent Mayer, um, Fred Gretsch, you know, all kinds of interesting people who have been, uh, you know, so great to me over the years. And it's, it's a pretty special window into that mentor student relationship. And I've had just rave reviews for that program. So folks can check that out at joes12.com. And uh, other than that, I have um, my last album came out a couple months ago. It's called Borders. And people can listen to that on Spotify or whatever streaming platform they'd like. And my website is joerobinson.com and there's some tabs and whatnot in my web store. And, and, uh, and I'm on all the social platforms too. Awesome. You've been very busy. You're accomplishing a lot. Um, you want to give us a playing sample of maybe uh, something off the new album or maybe something off out of a new course? Sure. I, I think I'll play a, uh, an unreleased original song that I have. It's called Byron's Bounce.
That was awesome. What's that called? Thanks, Desi. It's called Byron's Bounce. Byron's Bounce. Plenty of bounce to it, too. And you said that is something that is on the album, or you have not released that yet? I have not released it. I've been writing some songs for a, an, another instrumental album. It's been about 10 years since I released, uh, a little over 10 years, actually, since I released an instrumental album. So uh, I've been kind of, you know, wor working on some new compositions and and uh, and that's one I'm planning on including on the next project. Yeah, it, it sounded fantastic. Uh, to the listeners out there, w there was a little bit of static there at the end um, just because we're connecting here on Zoom and uh, sometimes it does some funny things with the audio. So I don't know if you noticed that on your end, Joe, did you hear that air coming up? <laughs> I heard some in my, in my little earpiece here. I wasn't sure what it was. Yeah, well, Zoom apparently corrected it. I'm, you know, I'm not sure, but anyway, it still uh, sounded uh, fantastic. And so, to my listeners, you can hear that. Uh, you know, Joe's super skilled with the uh, finger style technique. For those of you that are just listening to the audio, um, he's, you know, he's got the thumb pick on, and he's uh, got all the fingers. Uh, uh, going there and stuff. And that's actually how you started an initial, or I guess that's the particular style that you, uh, became known for yeah. first, you had entered some competitions and I think you were mentored by Tommy Emmanuel, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I first started playing electric and blues rock and things like that, but I, I, I grew up in a small town in Australia and I just couldn't find other musicians who were as passionate about music as I was. So I, you know, discovered Tommy Emmanuel and, and had the chance to meet him and was just really uh, determined to figure out how to develop a solo show like him. So I didn't need to rely on other musicians. So I started to, you know, play small festivals and clubs and pubs in Australia, wherever they let me in being underage at the time. And uh, eventually I was, I was uh, on Australia's Got Talent and I, and I won that in 2008 when I was 17. So that, that was a big break and I became known as, you know, the, the guy who just played guitar in one of those shows and, and won it. So that was, a, it was a special, special time. Um, but then later you kind of got reconnected to some of your rock roots. You started singing, uh, uh, writing songs. Um, you know, you released some albums where you played a lot of electric guitar, which you are equally skilled at. So you're kind of, you know, just as comfortable playing acoustic finger style as you are, you know, shredding on the electric. Yeah. You know, I, um, I love playing all kinds of different styles and, you know, that's one of the great things about being in Nashville is, you know, I'll be out one weekend playing guitar in Emmylou Harris's band and, you know, I have really great opportunities like that. And I'll be doing sessions with some of the great, you know, musicians here. And then I'll be doing a solo concert and I'm um, doing some dates with Tommy Emmanuel later in the year. So I, I feel really fortunate to have a lot of different, uh, types of musical experiences and, uh, and, um, and yeah, pr pretty early on when I started playing my own concerts, I realized that after an, in a 90 minute show, I didn't want to just play the same kind of thing the whole set. I wanted to keep people's attention. So I started to sing and I would bring on, started to bring on an electric guitar and I'd play a couple of songs on the electric and yeah, just tried to, you know, use um, as, as many different influences and styles that I like to play to create an entertaining show for people. So that's where it kind of it all, all, all came from. And, you know, I, I have only seen you once live and it was at a club in Detroit, Michigan. This would have been back, well, maybe around the time that we recorded the podcast. It must have been the, the first one back in 2013. Yeah. Um, Is that the magic bag? I think it was the magic bag. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, I used to play in that area as well. I should have remembered that, but um, <laughs> you've got a better memory than I do, apparently. Well, um, I only played in Detroit once or twice. Uh, in fact, possibly only, only that once. And, um, and I remember that show. It was, it was, a, it was a fun night. The, the fellow who was also on the bill, I forget his name, but he was on American Idol and came like second or something. <laughs> he, he, he became really popular. So pe people would message me and say, Hey, you know that guy that you played on the show with? I, oh, he later went on to American Idol? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I can't remember if he opened the show or if I opened for him. Um, but yeah, he, he became quite famous. <laughs> he's, he's quite, he, you know, he, he had his uh, American Idol moment. It was pretty cool. Well, so we've talked about how um, 
you've become quite skilled at uh, different guitar styles and techniques. And that's due in part to the reasons that you outlined, like you wanting to put it together a great show and you, you know, having a, a passion and a drive for music and couldn't find other people that shared that with you. So you wanted to kind of put all the pieces together yourself and play these kind of full um, uh, arrangements. Uh, later, you got into singing and songwriting. So uh, the main topic of today's uh, podcast is your practice routine, because uh, um, you obviously have uh, a lot of natural gifting for music. However, you know, natural talent will only take you so far. Um, natural talent really just kind of means that you have a potential for it, but you still got to put the work into it. And I know that you have a pretty, I've heard that you have a very vigorous practice routine. I think I've even heard you say crazy things like you wake up at four o'clock in the morning or something to, to begin this uh, uh, practice routine. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, I would love to hear like, Maybe if you could go back and and talk about when this uh, uh, when this practice routine of yours began, when you really started to get super intense with it, and then maybe how it's kind of developed over the years, and then what what you do today, just like on a daily basis, just to keep your chops up and continue to move forward. Yeah, well, it all started when I was a teenager, and I went into the studio for the first time, and I realized that I didn't sound quite as good as I thought I I did. So there's that feeling of hearing yourself played back through the speakers for the first time and realizing, wow, I'm speeding up and slowing down and some of the notes aren't played clearly and, you know, the dynamics aren't what, what I want them to be. And, and I just became really determined to get my technique together. So I started to wake up at 4 a.m. Th throughout high school. And this is, you know, probably I was 15, 16 uh, you know, 14, 15, 16, about that age. And, um, and I would practice, you know, three and a half hours or so before school. And uh, I learned so much during that time. I, you know, have a, I would keep a practice journal. I actually at the time had a whiteboard on my wall and I'd have 15 minute blocks. And I still use the same technique in which I would write, you know, scales, uh, working with a metronome, working on an arrangement, working on a particular song, learning a new idea from, you know, the guitar player magazine article I was reading or, or you know, whatever. I kind of just build this uh, regiment for myself. And, uh, and I also had a, a library of instructional VHS tapes and DVDs that I, that I learned to play from because I'm out in the bush, you know, in Australia. And I uh, didn't have access to, um, you know, great teachers per se, but I did have access to a lot of great musicians who would, you know, let me sit in with their band and jam with them and, you know, that's kind of how I, I learned. And so I, um, I really learned so much during that time. And whenever I get the chance to, I love to wake up early and practice like that. Unfortunately, it isn't very congruent with the touring lifestyle. So on the road, you know, you go on stage at 8 p.m. typically. So it's difficult to get into, in bed before midnight. So usually it's kind of in bed at midnight up at 7 a.m. That's the kind of touring routine. But when I'm off the road, which I have been for the past year due to COVID-19, uh, I love to wake up early. And so this morning I woke up at 4.08 a.m. I've been using this app called Sleep Cycle, which actually wakes you. Uh, it, it's a little bit creepy. It records you while you sleep and it it uh it takes note of when you're tossing and turning and that therefore it can kind of determine your REM cycle so it wakes you it doesn't just wake you abruptly at 4 a.m it wakes you between 4 and 4 30 <laughs> so it um it kind of you know li listens to me and waits me at at the, the the ideal time in that window uh, what time did you go to sleep though i went to bed at uh i tried to go to bed earlier last night i went to bed at 8 30. okay all right so you're still getting a good uh, amount of sleep. Yes. Se seven to eight hours. Uh, eight hours is really great. It, it's just so difficult to, <laughs> to, 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 to get it sometimes, but yeah, g generally, you know, six is a minimum, but seven is probably the average. And, uh, yeah, I, I wake up and I, and I read for 30 minutes after cleaning my teeth and whatnot. And, uh, I've been reading a great book about practicing actually called Peak by Anders er Ericsson. And, and he, he was the scientist behind the 10,000 hour you know, study and has some really fascinating information about the importance of deliberate practice, which is uh, 
something I think a lot about. So, yeah, I mean, some people would, you know, hear this and think that I'm just this super disciplined person, but the way I think about it is it's actually just, you know, I, I've found a, a routine and some habits that work for me. And once, once I kind of get used to them, it's just like, okay, I just, I just do what I do. I just go to bed at that time because I'm pretty tired. And then I wake up at that time because I'm ready to go. And I have a practice journal. And uh, in my bookshelf here, I have stacks and stacks of practice journals. I really find that I have a more effective practice session if I map out what I'm going to do and kind of tick off, you know, uh, you know, each 15 minute block once I've finished it. And so I basically have a three hour practice block right now from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. And then from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., I'll take care of emails and whatnot and all the stuff that, you know, has to, has to be done. And then at 9 a.m. I'll have breakfast. So that's my morning ritual right now. That's fantastic. You know, that's that's awesome. I used to follow something similar when uh, when I was younger. It's so funny to hear you talk about, um, you know, your whiteboard, whatever. I used to use storyboards. If you're familiar with that, I had like these styrofoam boards and I would get these multicolored uh, like note cards and would write out different stuff and put it on there when I was a teenager. And, um, you know, everyone thought I was a little nuts, a little crazy, and I would wake up early. I wasn't waking up at four o'clock, but I might wake up at six or seven or something like that to try to get a couple hours before I had to go into work or something like that. It's so funny to hear you mention this because I look back and I'm like, where did that idea come from? Like, what other young person would decide to do something like that? Typically, they, they, they didn't. But yet, you know, uh, you, you, uh, you fell into the same thing. And I think it's like if you, if you love music, if you love guitar, and I think if you have the right type of driven personality that um, you're going to choose to really pursue it uh, hard, you know. I'm guessing that you're not the type of kid that would sit around playing video games for hours, that you would always, that you would have rather had your guitar in your hand, right? Well, truthfully, I loved playing Age of Empires. That was the only video game we had in the house. Um, but my parents just like basically forbid it. It was basically like there was no way you would have a game console. I mean, we weren't even allowed to watch TV during the week. It was like... You'd, you'd, you'd put on the, the, the news. We had a TV about the size of a dinner plate. You know, I grew up on, basically on a hundred acre, you know, property. And uh, I get home from school and, you know, I'd split firewood and, you know, help my dad with some fencing. And and then we'd, we'd sit around and hang out and uh, occasionally we'd be able to watch The Simpsons. <laughs> that was a real treat. But I remember one time I got suspended from high school. I got in a fight or something and, and it was a TV band for a year. <laughs> so... I wasn't even allowed to watch TV. Wow, so that's probably the best thing for my guitar playing. And my my parents really, really believed in you know just kind of uh, you know I, I had I have three three brothers and, and I, well two brothers and a sister, so three siblings, and uh, and yeah it was a really great childhood up you know in the in in, in the bush, and uh, yeah if I had a video game console I probably I might have became a a coder or something who knows but for <laughs> me music was my was my out music was a way for me to get on stage and for for me to you know show off what i did i love the feeling of performing I, I think you know some people are naturally born composers and some people are naturally born com uh, performers and and you know I, I i really enjoyed performing and uh and i also enjoyed making up my own songs as opposed to learning songs ver verbatim but I actually started on the piano when I was about five or six and I just really wasn't cut out for that. So the guitar for me was, you know, an, an instrument that felt really natural and I could see, I could see how I could get good at it if I, if I practiced. And, um, I went to a, like a Salvation Army type store one time when I was, I was younger and I found a 10 year supply of guitar player magazines and it was like for $10 or something. It was for it was for nothing and so i bought it and i i read every article and this is from the 70s and 80s so i would read articles by you know a lot of these shred guitarists and i i don't know where i got the idea to get up and have that kind of routine but i'd read about people you know practicing eight hours a day and i'd be thinking oh man that would be so cool wouldn't that wouldn't i get so great so that's all i mean so you just had a genuine passion for it which is something that i can r really you know uh, relate to um 
you know, I was kind of the oddball kid that wasn't always interested in what most kids were interested in. I was like, well, can I just go home and play my guitar? Um, but uh, I love that. And you're just totally immersed in it. I mean, I love that you're reading these uh, interviews with famous guitarists, reading these magazines, getting up early. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, thank God for your parents. I, it sounds like you even probably uh, inherited a bit of something from your parents where they were people that were going to get up and they were going to actually do something and be productive. You know, they, they didn't want their children sitting in front of the TV. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. I think that that turned out well for you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that they have some combination of kind of the, you know, the, like, um, you know, it was a kind of a farmer, like we grew our own food and we had cattle and it was just this kind of homesteading type lifestyle. But my dad's a surfer. So, you know, he just loves to surf. And but but both my parents play a little bit of music. And so there was just music and, uh, you know, doing things outside. And and I, I was kind of, uh, you know, honestly, I, I was a little determined to get out of the bush, so to speak, when I was younger. I remember, I remember feeling like, frustrated like kids in high school would say are you going home to sleep in your cardboard box joe <laughs> they'd, they'd tease me but i knew that music was a way for me to uh you know be on a be on a, a, a bigger stage and uh and and for, for me to you know as soon as i saw tom tommy and phil, phil emmanuel and, and and met them i was just like okay game on that's that's what i wanted i want to do i want to figure out how to how to play like that and how to have that kind of lifestyle well, so let's talk about how you uh, got to the point where you could play like that. So, um, you know, you were very driven, you were very organized. You, so you'd get up early, you would put these practice routines together. So tell me about uh, how you would structure a practice routine. Well, uh, a really influential video for me was uh, by John Petrucci called Rock Discipline. And uh, it, it came out, I want to say in, in the 90s, probably, but I would always start with uh, a series of stretches that I learned from him in that, in that video. So I'd stretch my forearms and honestly, I do 10 to 15 minutes of stretching just about every morning. And I found that that was a really great primer for working on like hardcore technique. And so for, and then I might go into, uh, working on my left hand technique. So I would sit there and just play, you know, an E and an F on the fifth and sixth fret with the, the first and second finger for about a minute and then I'd go to the next two fingers the middle and ring finger do that for about a minute then do the ring finger and the pinky for about a minute which is really hard for most people getting that pinky to be strong and then I do some kind of uh, exercises like this so that's going F G F E and then I'd go F sharp G, F, E, F sharp E. So I do these kind of legato left hand exercises to really just try and get my left hand to be strong. And I'd really focus on trying to have my forearm be very relaxed. And I would practice in front of a mirror to make sure I was, I, I wasn't, there was no unnecessary tension. So th these kind of principles are really the foundation of being able to play fast and clean and that, that kind of thing. And then I'd work on my right hand, you know, I'd maybe play chromatics, kind of like the like the shred mus musicians do where I'd play uh, alternate picking four notes per string. Speeding up. With a metronome. Like Flight of the Bumblebee almost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very much that kind of thing and playing fast can actually teach you a lot about technique because you soon realize where where your limit is and where you start tensing up and start getting tight and if you can dial the metronome back and just concentrate on staying relaxed and then speed it up a little bit and just keep going it's kind of a measurable way to track you know how fast you can play clean and relaxed so i would do those kind of technical exercises and I also studied music theory in high school. You know, I took um, classical music theory up to grade six or seven, I think. And that was a really great experience to me, just learning, you know, the foundations of, of harmony. And and I'm, I'm a terrible sight reader, 
but I at least understand how it all works. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, a lot of my time was spent learning arrangements with fingerstyle guitar. I think one of the best ways to develop the chops and the technique is to, is to have a good repertoire of, of songs. And fortunately there's countless great arrangements by Chet Atkins and Mel Travis and Jerry Reed and Tommy Emmanuel and all these people that have been a big influences on, on my playing. So yeah, it was kind of a, a, a lot of technical things and then songs, writing some songs and, and, uh, I'm guessing if I had to guess the songs and the repertoire probably took uh, a bigger portion of time. Like once you were stretched and kind of warmed up and that really you were focusing then on, cause the exercises uh, have their place, but they are just an exercise. When you, if you really want to make music, you have to play things that are, are musical. So that was kind of all prep just to get you ready to get into those finger style arrangements that you mentioned, which, um, you know, there's a lot going on in them and it takes a lot of time to work them out and practice them and get the facility to, to play them well. Yeah. I, I think, you know, with fingerstyle guitar, it's like the first few songs you learn are really difficult. Like I remember the first time I learned windy and warm. Getting the thumb to do that good it was really difficult let alone adding the fingers but once i got relatively comfortable with that song and i learned another song like freight train Once I got, you know, fairly comfortable with that one, and honestly, it sounded pretty rough at first, I would learn, you know, a few others. And, you know, the fifth song's way easier than the fourth song, and then the sixth song's easier, and it just becomes easier and easier as you get more kind of exposure to different combinations of notes with the right hand, and as the left hand becomes stronger, because it takes a lot of strength to play fingerstyle guitar with the left hand, because all the notes have to be clean and clear, and and, uh, and, you know, I'm playing an acoustic guitar. I have, a, I have a 16 on my high E, so I use heavy strings. Although I, I use a heavier high E than the rest of the, the gauge. It's a set, set of 12s, but I use a heavier high E. And, uh, and that's because you're talking about on your acoustic guitar here. You don't do that on your electric, do you? No. On an electric. Right. I, so on that acoustic guitar, you want to make sure you have a good full tone with those melody notes that are off, often going to be on the top string and with a typical gauge of uh, acoustic strings. It might sound a little thin on top, which is fine for most acoustic playing, but for the fingerstyle stuff, the chord melody stuff, you might want to have a little bit more tone out of those notes in the upper range, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're working on uh, songs and then, so were you also like working on building a repertoire because you wanted to go out and perform those songs? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I used to, uh, you know, stand in front of the mirror and I'd play my whole set. <laughs> and so uh, in, in Australia, I used to play a lot of, you know, music festivals and Australia's, you know, it is kind of a, you know, drinking listen to some music culture you know that's that's kind of a, a big part of the uh and it's it's, it's always summer there so, so there's lots of out, out, outdoor gigs and music festivals going on so yeah i would play you know a, a, a few hours set at a at a festival or fundraiser and all kinds of diff, diff, different events and and i'd take my little aer acoustic amp along and i'd and i'd just play and i found that you know i, I figured out what songs worked which songs impressed people and which songs would get them to buy my CD. Mm. And, uh, and that's the thing about what, you know, performing is once you step on stage, you learn really quick where the weak spots in your playing are, you know, and especially I used to record myself, you know, I'd, I'd listen back to, to critique the show. And I found that, I, you know, I mean, still to this day, the biggest battle is, is, is timing is getting everything to be so in the pocket and so on the, you know, on, on the money with regard to the groove. Um, 
so I, I would I would certainly practice my my live set and work on yeah playing everything slowly and fast and quiet and loud and just try and get as comfortable as I I can with playing songs. You know, I've I've really I've really come to learn that so much of of what I do is muscle memory, and the way to train the hands to remember what to play is to play it over and over again with a really relaxed technique. Right. Yeah. Lots of repetition. I mean, it's really the the only way. It's funny how many people email me and contact me because, you know, I got a lot of students. I sell tons of courses and stuff. And they're like, so what, you know, how do you get yourself to memorize a song? How do you get yourself to play something without uh, looking at the chords in front of you? Because as soon as I look away from the sheet, I don't remember the song. I'm like, you you run it over and over and over until you stop thinking about it and your fingers just kind of know where to go. Uh, muscle memory takes over. Yeah, people would sometimes say to me, oh, I love listening to you play so much. I'd love to have you just serenade me at work all day. And anyone that's been around me when I practice <laughs> will testify to the fact that I just play the same thing over and over and over and over again. Whatever new song I'm working on, I'll just loop <laughs> that tricky little bar or that, you know, the intro, and I'll play it painfully slowly with a, you know, a, a metronome just belligerently <laughs> ticking away and, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been doing live stream concerts lately and, and I'll see a chat on the screen and, and I'll get requests for songs. In some cases I haven't played in 10 years and I'll just sure I'll say, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And my hands will remember how to play it. It's absolutely shocking because my brain has no idea of <laughs> you know what that song is. I can kind of hear it, but it's amazing to me that the hands remember it. So, uh, I mean, muscle memory is incredibly powerful. Really? It, it really it really is in fact you know i even have moments where i have i'm trying to play something that i had forgotten and sometimes i'm trying to think about it like what key was it in where did it go and sometimes that helps you know things start to come back um but other times i just have to stop thinking about it and i was like just give me a second and i make myself go through the motions as if i knew how to play it and oftentimes sure enough my fingers go there i'm like there it is. So I'm, 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 I'm trying to recall that muscle memory. You're touching on a lot of things here, Joe, that I am constantly preaching in mm -hmm. my, uh, um, you know, podcast about, you know, putting time into practice, about um, being intentional about what you choose to uh, practice, about how everything really, how songs are the end goal, no matter what you're doing. Um, and so you always want to work toward applying the techniques that you're uh, working on or the theory that you're studying, you always have to work on applying it to something musical and that's songs. Mm -hmm. And you always want to work on having complete songs, whether you're trying to put together a set list and be a performer like you, or if you're just someone who's just a hobbyist at home, you still want to kind of take uh, the same approach as the professional. You probably won't be as, it's not going to be as intense. But you still, at the end of the day, want to say, I've got these songs down and I have a repertoire and I can play them for my own enjoyment or, or uh, play them for uh, um, uh, others. And the muscle memory thing about just going through something over and over until you stop thinking about it and uh, muscle memory uh, takes over. And everyone in my family can attest to that. You know, they, they really, um, my guitar playing is really an annoyance uh, that more than anything else to them. And uh, my wife loves to tell stories about me driving her crazy by playing the same things over and over, particularly early on in our relationship in marriage, when I used to play gigs at the coffee shops and stuff where I would do finger style, you know, like Beatles stuff and that sort of thing before I started playing in, in, in bands. And as you mentioned, you, so the, really the only way to get comfortable with that stuff, especially when it gets a little bit more intricate, is you just have to do it over and over and over. So like uh, to this day, my wife um, can't listen to the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds because I was working out a finger style arrangement of that, trying to play the melody and the top strings with, uh, with the, the, it's kind of like a descending melody, but then you have this ascending bass line. Mm. And I was put, trying to put the two together and uh, apparently I just practiced it a little too much and I've ruined the song for her. So <laughs> uh, I, know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, what a, so 
would you like work towards saying i'm gonna get, have like a one hour set of music and then it was like okay now i want a two hour set of music and like uh, tell me a little bit about uh, planning the, the your repertoire kind of like by set or by length or by performance yeah well early on when i first started playing pretty much as soon as i started playing the guitar i came from the piano and i i started to play the guitar and i learned just really simple songs uh you know like wipe out <laughs> and uh I was in the school band and my mom was kind of one of the assistants for the school band. My mom plays drums and piano and, you know, is quite a musical person. And, and, you know, there was, you know, maybe a dozen people in the school band and the school band teacher said, Oh, you guys should start a little, little group and go in the battle of the bands. Like that'd be really cool. And we were 10 or 11 years old and we thought, Oh, great. And so we had a, a boy who played the bongo drums and uh, a girl who played the bass because her father was a musician. And, a uh, boy who played recorder, he he got a saxophone and the bongo player got a drum set. So I, we started this little mini rock band and I grew up, you know, kind of learned the songs I'd learned with my guitar teacher. I took lessons for the first year or so of playing and, and I, we'd go and learn the songs with the band. And when we got a 30 minute set, it was like, okay, we can perform somewhere now. And so we'd go out and play on stage and I was just hooked on performing. And then it was like, okay, how do we get an hour set? And so we'd learn some more songs and how do we get a two hour set? And then we get a three hour set. And then, it, and then it became like, okay, Joe, you can't just play a 15 minute guitar solo on every Santana cover we do. <laughs> and, uh, and we developed, you know, a three to four hour set. And then when I started playing solo acoustic, yeah, it really took a while to get that repertoire. And I, I remember, remember playing in, in cafes, uh, playing background music where I could kind of just play I could just vamp on chords and that was totally fine. That was perfect for the environment. So I would just play like moon dance, something like that. I have the bass and the melody go. And then I just go. take a bass solo <laughs> and so I just find ways of stretching out the set as much as I could until I learn enough material and and uh you know when I came to the Chet Atkins convention in Nashville I found that all the players there were playing songs like Cannonball Rag and you know Jerry Reed songs like Jiffy Jam and and Avalon and I'll See You in My Dreams and this kind of repertoire of like the finger style standards. So I, I basically learned a lot of those songs so I could jam with people. And and uh, yeah, when, when people send me a message on Instagram or on my Guitar Synergy channel and and they say that they feel like they've hit a plateau with finger style playing, I always suggest the same thing and it's repertoire. It's fo focus on your repertoire. And I, I have a repertoire journal <laughs> and I have a list of all the songs I know how to play in the bluegrass style, all the songs I know how to play in the gypsy swing style, all the songs I know how to play, you know, jazz standards, finger style arrangements, my original songs. And, you know, and I have a bunch of lyrics to songs that I know how to sing. And and it's, it's, it's really fun for me to just organize the pieces I know like that and keep brushing up on the ones that I'm not as, as, uh, as um yeah for familiar with and and i think uh yeah learning that material is is a huge part of what it's all about for me yeah i love that you say that because one of the things i always try to get across to students is you got to let your repertoire lead you um mm -hmm. you know if someone says well i just uh i don't feel like i'm very good with um you know playing in the major pentatonic i can do minor blues stuff but i just don't feel like i'm good like what should i do i'm like Go learn 10 songs that, uh, you know, have solos that are based in the major pentatonic, you know, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, people are like, I feel like when I improvise, um, my playing doesn't flow or I just I'm lacking ideas. What do I do? And I say, well, first, go learn a bunch of other solos and memorize them and analyze them and look at the licks and phrases and build a vocabulary and then try your hand at improvising. And at that point. Uh, you've got something to work with, and uh, you're likely going to um, come up with some of your own ideas uh, as well. So, again, I love that you, I love that you're kind of reinforcing everything that I've been uh, uh, preaching here. You know, let the let the repertoire uh, uh, kind of uh, lead you. Um, I love that you moved here. You saw that people were playing things that were a little bit different than what you were familiar with. So, what did you do? You learned those songs, 
And all the, then they became part of your repertoire. And now you can go out and play with those people. And I'm sure that you learned some new things uh, from the process. And even though you're always kind of putting your own spin on things, mm -hmm. um, a big part of, um, you know, developing as a player is, is vocabulary. And you learn that vocabulary by just first learning what somebody else has done. And then the kind of the next step is then, okay, what, where, where can I take this? What, what can I do with this? I love that you mentioned earlier too, that you are, are were always recording yourself as well. Such a great way to critique yourself. And uh, you never really know what you sound like until you record yourself and listen to it. And uh, sometimes you can uh, be surprised in good and bad ways, you know? There's sometimes where I'd be like, oh, wow, that sounded sloppy. I thought I had that tight. And other times where you'd probably experience this too, where I'm like, wow, that sounded super slick. I didn't realize it, it came out that good, you know? So, um, and uh, I'm always encouraging people to record themselves as well because it um, kind of gives you something to show for yourself for all the work that you put into, um, you know, learning music it's nice to have some recordings and say hey i did this that's that's me playing you know particularly for people who are hobbyists which is going to be most of my listeners here um it you know if you're a professional you get to release the album you know you get to play those those big uh live performances and stuff and that gives you a great sense of accomplishment where if you're just a hobbyist you kind of never do that and you can kind of get stuck in this cycle of just kind of perpetually practicing but you never you never go anywhere with it or have something to show for it. So I tell people, record yourself. And if at anything, at the end of the year, you're going to have, you know, a dozen or so recordings, whether it's an audio recording or maybe you made a video and posted it to your YouTube channel. And it's like, hey, I've got something to show for what I've done. We've gotten a little off track here, Joe, but I just want to kind of tie this into um, the interest of my uh, um, uh, listeners. So I wanted to... Uh, uh, talk about, you mentioned that you have this course called Joe's 12, where you influenced some pretty well-known um, guitar players and um, who, some of whom have become mentors, but I think mainly you pick people that were big influences um, uh, on you. Uh, you mentioned uh, Tommy Emanuel, you mentioned uh, yeah, Steve, Steve Vai and, Vai. and Robin Ford, uh, John Jorgensen, uh, Rory Hoffman, who's an incredible local musician. Yeah, I mean, just uh, people I had a, have a personal connection with that have inspired me and encouraged me. And, uh, yeah, the way the course is cut is, you know, the first week is about a 90 to two hour, 90 minute to two hour video about practicing. So I interviewed Steve Vai and asked what he thinks about practicing. And, and then I talked to Eric Johnson and asked what he thinks about practicing. And then I talked to Tommy Emanuel and, and then I talked to John Jorgensen and it's just kind of this cross section of different ideas and advice that they give me. And, and I talked about my routine and what I do and you know much of what we talked about in this, in this chat. Um, but I was constantly learning things from, from these people. And I still reflect on some of the, the conversations and just think, wow, I, I really learned uh, something that I wasn't ex expecting to learn. And, uh, Keb, Keb Mo was, was another. And, and, uh, throughout this, you know, past year, I've just been thinking about, you know, what, why is music so important and what, and why has music changed my life? And, and like, what do I need? What is my job as a, as a musician? What is our job as a musician, wh whether we're playing for the fun of it or whether we're doing it professionally. And it's really just about, you know, about making people happy and, and spreading joy. And that was something that, that Kev Mo and, and Tommy Emanuel both, you know, were pretty clear on in, uh, in the Joe's 12 interview. I, I asked people what their why is, what their mission is. And, and um, yeah, that's something that I, I, I think, think back on a lot. It's, it's kind of like, you know, asking a chef, you know, why is, why is cooking and making food important? Because people like to eat and it tastes good. You know yeah. what I mean? And so people, we love music. I mean, it's just this wonderful, uh, this wonderful gift. And it's just, uh, it brings people pleasure. Sometimes it brings people pleasure because they're a performer and a player. And sometimes they're just a listener and a, uh, a connoisseur. But um, we all seem to find pleasure in one way or another. So you've mentioned several guitar players, and I can obviously see some obvious um, 
uh, influences Tommy Emmanuel for sure with the finger style stuff. So uh, you mentioned like uh, Steve Vai and Eric Johnson. What's an example of what's something that you uh, took away from Steve Vai? Well, Steve Vai, he wrote a series of articles for Guitar Play Magazine in the 80s called uh, Little Black Dots. And he would uh, have things in the in the articles like musical meditation. And so I'd read this article and I'd think, wow, I've, I've never even heard of meditation. And I'm up in the bush in Australia and I think that's a pretty cool idea. And so in the mornings I would kind of really try to zen out. And when I'm practicing, I would just try to really be in the present moment and not have any distractions. And, you know, the only distraction was like the roosters prowling, but <laughs> really try and be focused. And, and he had this this uh, exercise where he would play one note for an hour. So he'd play the D note on the guitar, in this case, the seventh fret in the G string. He'd play that for an hour and experiment with all the different ways to use vibrato to bring all the beauty, beauty out of the note. And this is something I do on an electric guitar, you know, with lighter strings, but I'd really just dig in and try and do faster vibrato, slower vibrato, side to side vibrato, and just work on every, and then I do some bends, try a higher octave, and just really try to get the vibrato to be controlled because that, that that's a big deal. If you can get your vibrato to be really sweet and musical, it makes everything you play so much, uh, yeah, so much smoother and cleaner and 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 more beautiful. So that's an example of something that you know inspired me with regard to Steve. And I, I also I read you know, a few biographies on Frank Zappa and became pretty interested in just his wacky creative vision. And, uh, you know, he influenced me a lot just as a kind of a musical creative spirit, uh, you know, at, more so than the actual musical ideas, which were pretty wacky. <laughs> but I, I, I really, um, you know, I know, I know Steve Vai was famous for practicing eight hours a day and transcribing Zappa's music by ear. And I was just kind of, um, yeah, really enamored with, you know, the idea that anyone could do that. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. I never made it to practicing eight hours a day. Um, but I know what you mean. Like just, uh, really being intrigued by someone who had that much drive and of course, seeing that, I mean, you know, he's considered a virtuoso. So there's, there's, there's something to be said about the effort that he put into it and, and its end result. And so if you, if you're someone that has a passion for guitar, um, you know, you hear these stories from other players and you're like, there's, there's something I need to take away from that. That's part why, in part, why we have you here on the podcast. So you mentioned Eric Johnson, who happens to be one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you uh, took away from his style or his playing? I used to eat my cereal every day in front of his Hot Licks video, uh, Total Electric Guitar. I mean, the idea of the whole pentatonic thing. You know, uh, I used to play Cliffs of Dover. And, uh, and, and Manhattan. And a few of his songs. And I, I played a Strat back when I was, my first, you know, guitar I bought was a Strat. So, you know, I, <laughs> he became an influence, you know, on, on the, the tone I was going for. And, and, uh, and, you know, Eric plays great fingerstyle guitar as well. He's been really influenced by Jerry Reed and Chet Atkins. And, and he talked about that in his early instructional videos. And, and, you know, he's the whole Texas blues, you know, trio thing was something that, that I really liked and that, you know, when I was putting together my first, you know, band, uh, well, we went for a power trio. So Eric's been a big influence on a number of levels. I just love his musicality and his touch and his melodic sensibility. I mean, just such a beautiful player. And, and he's someone that, that I met and that, uh, you know, really encouraged me and was really so kind to me. And, you know, I remember someone sent me a video of him in a music store giving a workshop and, and they said, who's a young player that's really impressing you at the moment? And he said, he said my name. And, uh, and I, I was just, yeah, really, really floored that, uh, that he was so generous and kind and, and he's just still one of my favorite guitar players ever. And I think he's also known for being super intense with his dedication to practice and always refining his technique and his tone 
Yeah. Yeah. And a tremendous rhythm guitar player, like you, you mentioned, it's like you could, uh, I mean, Cliffs of Dover is amazing. His guitar solo work is amazing. But if you just analyze just his, his chord work and his voicings and uh, yeah, someone who certainly thought outside the box. Yeah. I, I saw him play recently. Well, three, three years ago or so. And he did the RV music on album in its entirety. And just listening to all those songs and the tones, I mean, he had the he had the exact rig he used on the on the album, and I mean, just absolutely breathtaking, breathtaking arrangements, breathtaking playing, breathtaking parts, breathtaking sounds. It was just, you know, it's just it's just really inspiring to to see someone who who has who has created that with the instrument and who has created something new. It was re really incredible. Well, Joe, this has been um, a great conversation. Um, anything you'd like to add to it before we wrap things up? I just like to say th thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I, I want to just encourage anyone out there who's, you know, feels like they've hit a plateau with their, with their playing. Yeah, you know, the, the thing I keep coming back to is, is um, you know, the, the, the power of, of deliberate practice and the things we've talked about is, you know, the, the, the power of repetition repeating the good habits you develop, you know, and, and having a, a great repertoire of material. And, you know, I, I just feel so passionate about communicating my, my love for the instrument with, with as many people as, as are interested And in, uh, music changed my life. And I, and I know it has a, a really important role to play in the world. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to chat with you today about, about practicing and, and, uh, I'm planning on waking up at 4 a.m. tomorrow, and honestly, I, I can't wait. <laughs> I have a have a recording session tomorrow, and I'm going to be kind of preparing material that I'm I'm going to be recording. So, lots of uh, lots of fun to be had there. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, people who are into woodworking they get so excited about going out to the wood to the uh, to the shop with uh, you know fr fresh batch of raw lumber and turning it into something. So as a guitar player, it's like, it's like a new day, a new practice session, um, review old stuff, but new stuff to explore. And it's always, it's always a, a, a new ad adventure. Well, so Joe has a lot of great content online. He's got instructional courses. He's got information about his live dates. He's also very active on social media and, and posts great clips of uh, him playing. Probably the best place for people to go is joerobinson.com. And I believe you've got links to all of your courses and uh, uh, social media. Although I did not I did not see a link to Instagram on your uh, website, uh, but um, you're very active on Instagram. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, you can also search, search uh, Joe Robinson Guitar at uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, YouTube, and you can find his content. So, hey, Joe, thanks for coming back on to, to the Guitar Music Theory podcast. Uh, you know, I was a fan of your playing the first time I heard you. I can't remember the first time I heard you, but it would have been, you know, back in 2013 or, 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 or slightly before that. Um, but the first time I heard you, I'm like, I like that. That's the kind of guitar playing I like. I like to uh, listen to. Of course, you recorded then. What was the first like major uh, full band singer songwriter album that you recorded? I believe it was here in Nashville, right? Yeah, that album is called "Let Me Introduce You." Yes, "Let Me Introduce You," which is a fantastic album, mm -hmm. and I still pull that up and listen to it uh, this day. And and what I love about it is that um, you play acoustic and electric guitar, and it's. Uh, just really shows your versatility and actually i'm hearing that on your uh most recent album as well mm -hmm. yeah i um you know that was my first album where i sang and and i recorded with a band you know for the most part i had a, a little bit of you know i had a rhythm section on a few songs in my very first album birdseed but my concept for let me introduce you was to combine the intricacies of what i would play as an instrumentalist you know really organized parts based um songs but added add vocals and a and a song around it so it was quite an ambitious task and it it was a uh it, it it took a lot of energy to 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 make that album but but i'm really proud of it and that's something that i'm really 
interested in figuring out because I feel like no one's done it in the way that I want to do it in that, you know, really combines uh, a well-orchestrated gu- guitar playing technique with with songs and and uh, and, and and vocals. Of course, there's a, bit, there's a lot of great guitar players who sing as well, but, you know, I have a... Uh, a different co- combo of ingredients that that, that I try to th- throw in there. So yeah, that, that, that's part of the um, the thrill for me is trying to create an original sound like that. And I think Let Me Introduce You was the first step in in that journey for me. Yeah, it's a great album. And I actually have started listening to your latest album too. What's it called again? Borders. Borders, yeah. And it sounds fantastic uh, as well. So, well, again, Joe, it's been awesome to have you uh, here. If anyone has any questions about Joe, you can contact him through his website, joerobinson.com. Joe, do you mind playing us out? I'd be happy to. In fact, I might play a song called The Prize, which features some vocals as well. Two, three. I had a one-way conversation with me, myself, and I back away, we've been living can't imagine why to get to where we're going it's a clouded compromise you're mistaken if you think i'm taking my eyes off the prize maybe i've been distracted quite possibly all right this big old bright and shiny world has kept me up at night we all know that price tag shouldn't come as no surprise You're mistaken if you think I'm taking my eyes off the price Some days I live with no regrets Some days I just ask soon for you Some days a diamond, some a stone Some things I just as soon leave alone 